Hello, fellow law nerds. Welcome to a special episode of Boom Lawyered, a Rewire News Group podcast hosted by the legal journalism team, half of which is on a plane. And so now I am being joined by one of my favorite people, Ellie Mistal. He is the justice correspondent for The Nation. He covers courts, the criminal justice system, and politics. He is the force behind the magazine's monthly column, Objection! which makes sense if you know Ellie. He's also the Alfred Nobler Fellow at the Type Media Center. And his first book is a bestseller. It's a runaway hit, an amazing book, which you ought to buy. It's called Allow Me to Retort, A Black Man's Guide to the Constitution. Did I get that right? A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. We like the alliteration here. Right, A Black Guy's Guide (laughs) to the Constitution. It's an amazing book. I have three copies. I have two hard copies and I have it on Audible. I don't know why. I'm a big fan of this guy. Welcome, Ellie. Hi, Amani. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, not a lot happening this week uh, and, uh, and around our parts, so it should be a, a pretty light uh, show, I imagine, right? A pretty light show, and I have to say that I am excited about this particular show, A, because I love hosting podcasts with you, but B, it's because it's our 200th episode. And our 200th episode was supposed to be at the um, Summit for Re- Religious Freedom next uh, in two weeks in D.C. We are doing a thing for the American Constitution Society, which is the like the broke Federalist Society. I mean, let's be honest. God bless them, but they don't have as much much money as the Federalist Society. But that was going to be our 200th episode. But then, of course, the courts decided to shit the bed. And so I feel fortunate to be able to do the 200th episode with you, even though Jess is not here and she's very jealous and sad on an airplane. Oh, I'm so sorry. She's missing all of the uh, crazy authoritarian uh, uh, uterus snatching news. Yeah, uh, let's talk about that. Let's talk about. So last night at 10 p.m., the Fifth Circuit decided to drop its ruling on uh, the case, the uh, Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine versus FDA. That's the case where rogue Trump judge Matt Kaczmarek relied on basically vibes and his feelings to rule that mifepristone should be essentially pulled from the market because it's so dangerous to women and because doctors who have to perform surgical, quote unquote, surgical abortions on these, quote unquote, post-abortive women are being traumatized by the process and therefore they have standing to sue. We'll get into all of that. But Ellie, I just want to ask you one question. And honestly, it's the first question I asked you the last time you co-hosted this podcast with me. And that is, what the hell, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Amani, we are we are so very deeply screwed. Um, the Fifth Circuit's uh, uh, opinion kind of temporarily or partially overruling uh, the district court ruling on, on the abortion pill is is exactly how it's, it's an ex- example of exactly how we're screwed, because that opinion was designed to do one thing, hack the media, right? Mm. It was designed to give the media a different headline. The headline, random Texas judge in Amarillo bans abortion pill nationwide, that wasn't flying for conservatives. So conservatives tried to change the headline by partially overruling the ban at least as it applies to the drug that was um, approved in the, the FDA approval process in 2000. But you got to like go into the you know actual opinion and look at exactly what they overruled. They didn't overrule the ban because it's crazy. They didn't <laughs> overrule the ban because it's stupid. They didn't overrule the ban because the standing argument was, was wackadoodle. They didn't overrule the ban because it, the ruling relied on fake science. Right. They overruled the ban because they said it was time barred because the uh, FDA was uh, the methadone was approved in 2000 and now we're in 2023. They're they're saying that there's no uh, statutory uh, limitations on on when you could bring that suit against the FDA. That in and of itself is a huge problem because it means that the next time or the next time or the next time um, you can bring those suits in a more timely manner. That's so that's number one. Number two. Uh, the Biden administration, one of the only really pro-abortion um, things that it has done, was to expand access to mifepristone, um, both approving it for use uh, uh, not just up to six weeks, but actually up to 10 weeks. That's where the science says um, the thing is still effective and safe. So extending in 2016, the FDA in 2016 extended it 
to 10 weeks. And the Biden administration, when it got in charge in, in 2021, they also made Mifepristone available through the mail. Mm -hmm. um, previously, you had to be in person at a doctor who like had to hand you the stuff like he's, like, you know, put it in your mouth, <laughs> right? Like come out to my car. You know, I got some, <laughs> I got some Mifepristone in the trunk. Why don't you come? Like it had to be like, now you can come just to my van, the... little girl and get some, right? <laughs> some, some abortion candy. <laughs> right? um, now you could get it through the mail. The Fifth Circuit completely like upheld those bans. So yeah. what the Fifth Circuit has done is very subtly instituted a nationwide six week ban on the abortion pill. You can only get it for the first six weeks. It's a it's a it's a stealth nationwide abortion pill ban. How many corporate media, mainstream media, New York Times type people do you think are going to write the headline that way? And, I, and I'm just going to jump in right now because in Slack earlier while Jess was on the plane, she was like, I really want to know what Ellie's take is on my take. Because that's one of the first things she tweeted is that that, that the court has now instituted, she called it a low-key six-week ban of sorts. And she said low-key of sorts because there are some states that still allow off-label use. Right. And so in those states, you'll be able to get an abortion. It's seven weeks, not six, but six, seven. It's around the same time frame. But that's exactly what has happened is that we are now at a nationwide, a, like more or less six week ban. And as you said, it does really shake up the narrative because the media doesn't know how to report on this stuff. Right. Like I remember when we were talking about the Dobbs decision and how what the headline that they wanted to splash across the New York Times was not Supreme Court reverses Roe versus Wade and criminalizes abortion, but rather Supreme Court allows abortion to stand if you just send it back to the states, right? They're always looking for a way to couch what the court is doing in something other than what it is, which is horseshit. Yes, and I find that really problematic. The media has two huge problems covering this issue. Um, one, apparently the only thing they know about the, the woman's reproductive process is something they learned in like PE in sixth grade and it involves a freaking stork. Right. I mean, like that's, that's how they start understanding the process. They, they, they weren't paying attention when they talk set, when they talk set said in high school, apparently. So that's problem number one. Problem two, the media has no clue how, how the law works. I mean, right. the, the, just some ignorant people in terms of like, how legal structures work. And that that's, brings me to the second stealth part of the Fifth Circuit's ruling. Left unabated, Kazimarek's uh, uh, ruling would have, I believe, been completely overturned by the Supreme Court. Even with the six conservatives, even with the Christian crazies on the court, even with Amy Coney Barrett, just give your baby to the fireman and it's fine. <laughs> even with all that, right? Uh, 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 the Fifth Circuit, the district court ruling um, was beyond the pale. I do not think that it would have upheld, been upheld. But this ruling, the Fifth Circuit's ruling, is much more clever and it's designed not really to survive Supreme Court review. I think eventually even the Fifth Circuit's ruling will get overturned. You do. But it's, I, I do, but I think it's designed to give the Supreme Court an excuse not to intervene, mm. not to weigh in right now, not to use the shadow docket, which they use every time Ken Paxson in Texas has a problem with Biden's immigration pri uh, priorities, not to use the shadow docket to let the quote-unquote normal pro process play out, which means that we are living in this quasi six, seven-week nationwide ban for years mm -hmm. until it actually percolates all the way up to the Supreme Court, right? We're, 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 if the Supreme Court doesn't intervene right now, then we go back to uh, a, 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 an appeal, a normal appeals process in the Fifth Circuit. We've got to wait a year for that to play out, another couple of months for the Sixth Circuit, Fifth Circuit to give its ruling. Then it has to be appealed to the Supreme Court. Then they have to grant cert. I mean, you see what they're doing here, right? But even so... Why would they Shouldn't even so, given the arguments that the Fifth Circuit has made, it seems to me the Supreme Court needs to step in anyway, because I can't get past the two major Civ Pro nerd things that I'm into. And that's the statute of limitations and standing. The statute of limitations, what they are complaining about is something that the FDA did I mean, first in 2000, and the Fifth Circuit said, okay, you're being ridiculous. But then we talk about this March 2016, you know, approval that that what the FDA did in March, 2016, six years from March, 2016 is March, 2022. 
Yep. They didn't file until November 2022. Yep. That's a smooth eight months later. Yep. So we're just ignoring civil procedure now, which I feel like is something that this court can do because no one fucking understands it anyway, right? No one is really going to understand, well, they should have filed eight months earlier, and so then they can't file at all? Even though these abortion pills are killing women and murdering babies, you're telling me eight months is the reason why we can't go after the FDA for approving this shit? That seems like something that people won't understand. And so the media and, and legal scholars who are a bad faith legal scholars, your Ilya Shapiro's and Jonathan Turley's and whatnot, even though they know damn well that these claims are time barred, they can sort of they can sort of lie to their audience. They can pretend to be dumb and dumb things down for their audience. That's number one. Number two, the standing arguments are beyond absurd. They have no standing. The case should be thrown out on that alone. What they are trying to argue is that because a couple of doctors, you know, slid in affidavits in with this, in with the documents, in with the court documents, like there was no trial. There was no putting these doctors on the stand and saying, okay, so you say on March 3rd, you had this complication. What was this complication? What happened? Who was this person? All of the stuff that you would get in a trial. We didn't get that. We just got a battle of declarations of affidavits. People say whatever the hell they want in that. Affidavits, right? You can finagle language in affidavits to make it seem like it's true, that you're not perjuring yourself, even though that's kind of what you're doing. And so the fact that we have these doctors saying, well, I treated a couple of women 10 years ago and they had complications. So that means that there's an imminent injury. Supreme Court precedent says you can't look to a couple of past injuries and use that as a sort of touchstone for what your future injuries may be. And what they're saying is that maybe in the future, someone who may have a complication might come into my clinic and they might make me do something that I don't want to do, which is a procedural abortion. And that's going to cause me enormous stress and trauma. I mean, all of these standing arguments don't make any sense because A, who are these people that are flooding into the offices of quote unquote pro-life doctors, right? And two, if doing your job causes you so much harm, there are doctors who do way more, way more difficult things. Even if you want to argue that abortion is outside healthcare and is something that is traumatizing to perform, there are people who are performing surgeries on child gunshot victims, mm -hmm. right? Why can't they sue gun manufacturers? Why can't they sue the government that has said that it's okay for gun manufacturers to have immunity, qualified immunity, or be immune from suit? Isn't that the government doing something that is causing direct harm to doctors under the Fifth Circuit's theory? I co-sign everything you said. Okay. Just making sure that I'm not out of pocket because I've been raging all morning and I may be a little unhinged. Just as Mistal concurs in full. With Justice Gandhi, right? I love it. One hundred percent. But here, here, here's you, you made the point that you don't think the media is going to be able to follow the rabbit hole down these two legally technical arguments, right? And I think you're probably right about statute limitations. But on the standing issue, so you know, a little little, little personal story. So the Casimir's uh, Casimir's ruling comes down while I'm in the green the Zoom green room about to go on television. Uh, for a scheduled hit that we were going to talk about Clarence Thomas and that guy, obviously. Right? So I've got 15 minutes to read this thing before I go on TV. And the first thing that I hit upon is the ridiculous, paternalistic, sexist arguments for standing. Right? Mm -hmm. there, remember, everything you just said is true. I will just add that the only way they even get into the court on standing is through third party, uh, uh, is, is their third party standing argument and their argument for why they, the doctors, can sue and not the women who arguably they claim were harmed by the drug is because the women who've had medical abortions are too ashamed right. or traumatized right and they're unable to sue the fda themselves because they're just little babies <laughs> and so these doctors have to do it for them that's their actual argument and it's a stupid <laughs> one because people who have people who have used medication abortion obviously think that medication abortion is something that they can use and that's something that's going to terminate their pregnancy they're going to be able to go on and live their life whether or not they regret it or not is rather irrelevant. And I will just say that the regret rate for abortion is practically nothing. So, but they want us to believe that these quote unquote pro-life doctors who are anti-medication abortion can somehow represent the interests of people who took medication abortion because they wanted to terminate a pregnancy. 
That does it's not the same thing as abortion providers suing on behalf of their patients because abortion providers want to provide abortions for people who need them and abortion patients want to have abortions provided to them by people who can provide them. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's not a symbiotic relationship when it comes to these activist quote unquote pro-life doctors and people who had a complication from medication abortion. They're assuming that these people who have complications are traumatized or were somehow coerced into this into this procedure, rather than just being someone who took medication abortion and had one of those very, very rare complications that occurs. So I think the media can follow this argument. Certainly, I thought people followed the argument when I was making it uh, <clears throat> um, on television. But here's the other thing. Even if the media can't follow that argument, you know who can? Big farmer, yo. Mm. Like, tur turns out, like, almost, uh, I think Mark Joseph Stern from Slate said it best. Basically, Big Farmer woke up on the same day and was like, holy crap. Oh, no. This is bad. <laughs> like, Big Farmer in unison realized the importance of this decision because if they can do this to the abortion pill, they can do it to, to any anything. drug. Yes. Any drug they want. And if this is all you have to do for standing, don't even have to ha find an actual victim. Have to find some doctors who say like, oh, I once saw a victim once when I was getting my coffee on Fifth Avenue. I saw a woman. She was sad and it made me sad. And so <laughs> Like, if that's your standing yeah. argument, Big Pharma understands that you can sue them for any drug the Christian right doesn't like at any time. Yeah. And, and that the FDA, the whole point of the FDA approval process, people forget, like, why the government works the way it does. The whole point of the FDA approval process is not for the consumer. It's not so you and I are just like, oh, I, this drug, FDA seal of approval, it's probably safer. No. It's so you can't sue right. the drug maker when it goes bad, right? right? It's like, oh, FDA approved this. That means you had all, this was totally safe. And you can't sue me if my drug makes you have like, you know, a third eye or makes you, you know, or right. like stops your heart. Or, like it's a lie. The FDA approval process is a liability shield mm -hmm. for the pharmaceutical industry. And if right. you take that away. Which is what the Christian conservatives are trying to do. You open up all of Big Pharma to these kinds of lawsuits. And Big Pharma don't like that. So right. this is one of the rare situations where the 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 pro choice um, 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 activists, where where people on our side of the aisle actually have some firepower in our corner from American big capitalist corporate business Which types. Which is right? frightening, really. Right? Like we got now we got to rely on Big Pharma. For reproductive rights, like I mean, yeah, I'm, we I'm you, obviously straight, we right, take the help enemy where we can of get. The enemy is my friend today. I guess. Right. right, right. But like, what's what's also fascinating to me is the way in which the Fifth Circuit and Casmerick and everyone is basically prosecuting this drug for doing what it does. Right. I mean, if you read Casmerick for working. The it's, problem with the drug is, is that, that it, it works. works. It does what it's supposed to do, and therefore the FDA shouldn't have uh, shouldn't have authorized it. Number one, and then number two, this idea that it has no therapeutic benefit over the alternatives. The alternative is surgery. The alternative mm -hmm. is the kind of abortion that abortion haters love for people to get because then they can point at the person and said, baby killer, dismemberment abortion, right? Medication abortion is just like a glorified miscarriage, right? It's not the, it doesn't carry the same sort of stigma. And my, and you know, my work wife, Jess Mason Piclo made this point. She said that, you know, part of the reason that they're going so hard after medication abortion is because A, they want to criminalize medication abortion, but B, they want to push pregnant people into procedural abortions. Because when you push people into procedural abortions, that's where the sort of criminalization rubber hits the road. That's where you can snatch up more people for pregnancy loss. And when people are getting procedural abortion, those are the kinds of abortions that people really hate. And so they don't feel as bad stigmatizing people who get those kinds of abortion. I mean, it's all wrapped up in this really twisted way. And, and the thing that bothers me about it is that they're succeeding because they're willing to lie and they're willing to lie unabashedly. I agree with all that, but I also I always think there's something even more sinister at play. And it goes back to male sexism. There's a reason why that kind of guy doesn't like pills, mm -hmm. right? Even though they're safer and 
They don't like pills because pills take away their control over a woman's body. Pills take away their right to know, right? Mm. Like if you're trying to get your woman pregnant and she's taking a pill, you don't get to know that. Right. You're just shooting blanks for all you know. You won't get to know right. Right. what's going on, right? Whereas if it's a condom or any other kind of birth control, you generally get to know what's happening. Same with the abortion pill, right? Mm-hmm. If you have to have a, a surgical abortion, you know, you're the guy you get to know. You're Herschel Walker. You get to pay for it. I mean, you get to be involved in that decision. And so whether or not, you know, whatever your kind of morals are on it, you you ha- you as the man have control over that situation, right? Medical abortion, abortion pill, you don't get to know. Yeah. What's and that's borne out pregnant? by that jackass in Texas who's suing who's suing his his ex-wife's friends for helping her get these pills because he didn't know. And she went behind his back and secretively went and murdered, quote unquote, murdered his baby. So I think and that's actually that, really the, smart. The, the, the kind of Christian conservative crazy people that we're talking about, that we're fighting against, that lack of knowledge, that lack of control is actually what freaks them out, mm-hmm. I believe, about the pills. Because objectively, the pills are what we should be going for, right? Objectively, what you should want is for somebody to be able to take a pill within the first six to 10 weeks of you know knowing full well that a lot of women don't know that they're pregnant until six, seven weeks, right? Uh, take a pill, and like you say, it's basically like an early miscarriage, and you move on, and mm-hmm. like, why wouldn't we want that? It's the, they don't want that because it doesn't allow them the control over women's bodies that they crave. Yeah. I want to switch gears and talk to you a little bit about junk science because that's been one of my just, it's just been a thorn in my side for the 10 years now that I've been working at Rewire News Group. The people that he cited, I mean, first of all, he cited that, that collection of anonymous blog posts, which right. I found just astonishing. I mean, he essentially went to a subreddit like a pro-life subreddit and just collected comments and said, see, the Fipristone is very, very bad. It's very, very bad. But I also want to talk about some of these studies that he cited, like studies that seem like they come ostensibly from peer-reviewed science journals when really they don't. Like about a decade ago, there were, David Reardon is one such person. He's actually an electrical engineer and has a PhD in like medical bioethics or something like he's not a doctor in any shape or form but somehow he cited in Kazmarek's brief as someone who knows something about pregnancy complications among low-income women Priscilla Coleman <laughs> talking about the trauma and the regret that women feel after an abortion that the literal study that he cited was debunked by like three or four different scientists a decade ago but yet they show up in these in these orders what what do you think that we can do or that lawyers can do, people who are litigating these cases can do to try and remove junk science from the from the litigation process? Because we can't win if judges are relying on absolute horseshit. You know, it's really difficult because to remove junk scientists, you have to remove junk judges, right? Like yeah. that it, it it it's the trash judges that allow the trash science to get in. It's it's particularly difficult when we talk about federal court, right? Like at, at, a, at, a, at a local trial court, we have standards for expert testimony, right? The Daubert standard, whatever. We have standards for like what one has to do to be qualified as an expert to talk in front of a jury. Like there's a, there's a process. We can debate whether or not that process is good or sufficient, but there's a process, right? What a judge can read and rely upon to make his decision there are no standards. There are no standards for what a judge can can ground their decision on other than, and this is going to sound weird, but other than embarrassment, right? Mm-hmm. Like that that used to be the thing that restrained judges from relying on completely junk science or completely stupid theories or, or whatever. The embarrassment of getting overturned by a higher court, right? But Republicans have, you know, over the course of decades, removed that key factor, removed Mm. the embarrassment, removed the shame that lower court judges are supposed to feel. So instead, they feel like crusaders. You know, Kazimark hasn't hurt his chances to getting promoted Mm. from the district court to the Fifth Circuit 
through these crazy rulings, right? Reed O'Connor, another kind of crazy, this time Bush appointed judge that is always coming against Obamacare, coming against LGBTQ rights. Um, he hasn't hurt his, and is always getting overturned. He hasn't hurt his chances to get appointed to the Fifth Circuit once you know, James Ho or whoever, or Kyle Duncan replaces Clarence Thomas. He, they haven't hurt their chances oh God, by being say Kyle crazy. Duncan replacing Clarence Thomas. You're going to give me a heart attack. Oh, my right? God. Yeah, go so ahead. So, like, being a crazy lower court judge used to be a career killer. Now, mm -hmm. it's a career accelerant. And that is that is the real, to me, that is the real root of the problem um, with the kinds of judges conservatives in the federal society appoint now. They don't appoint people who want to play by the rules. They appoint people who think they are on holy crusades and that they will be, you know, born out in the fullness of time. And that is that is a big that is how you get all of this junk science. And remember, at the Supreme Court, you get you've got it coming from the other side, where Clarence Thomas is, you know, in New York State and Rifle Pistol Association, the Bruin. Clarence Thomas is saying that judges aren't allowed to look at science, aren't right. allowed to look at data, aren't allowed to look at stuff when it comes to gun regulations because all the science is bad for them. So now judges aren't even allowed to look at it. When it comes to gerrymandering, you got John Roberts basically being like, oh, my God, math is so hard. We're judges. <laughs> all right? We're, we're not Russell Crowe and Beautiful Mind, guys. Okay? We're just judges. And okay. so Roberts literally, and his boy Anthony Kennedy back in the day, literally wouldn't take mathematical evidence for 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 the racism of gerrymandering and instead ruled on the gerrymandering cases based on vibes and feels but then but when it comes to abortion they're more than happy to just pull whatever out of the air right and gonzalez v carhart kennedy waxed on about how you know i think he even said something to the effect of i don't have any evidence to prove this but it's probably pretty true that women really don't like getting abortions and they they experience extreme regret what are you talking about you it's just vibes and feelings and thoughts it's, and it's but only like when it comes to abortion only when it comes to trans rights only when it comes to lgbtq rights when it comes to guns when it comes to protecting cops like you know, the rules are different. The rules it's, change. It's almost like federal judges are completely outcome determinative. Yes. And like that, that has been the fight that I feel like I've had my whole career where like everybody said, everybody wants to say, whether you're, whether you're Adam Liptak, whether you're Elena Kagan, who I had for Civ Pro, everybody wants to say yeah, like, oh, judges are constrained <laughs> by this and that. They look at the interpretive. And I'm like, no, never. At no point has a judge actually done that. Mm -hmm. It's all freaking outcome determinative from the ground all the way to the top. They look at what they want to happen and then they backfill the law and the reasoning to get to where they already want it to go. That's how they do it. And I'm not even saying that doing it that way is bad. I'm saying let's be honest about what they're doing. Right. And then understand that to win these legal arguments what you actually have to do is to appoint more people who agree with your outcomes than the other guys. Because right. that is what Republicans have done. That is what Mitch McConnell figured out. That is how what the entire federal society already figured out. That if they actually want to win these cases in court, they can't use the law because the law doesn't help them. What it they have to vibes. do is appoint <laughs> judges who will, who will write to their outcomes regardless of the law. And that's what they've done. And it is a lesson that liberals have been slow on the uptick to take. Take, you know, we. I, I still think that you know Barack Obama lived in this world where like conservatives were reasonable mm -hmm. and could conservative justices were reasonable and could be reasoned with. He didn't get the memo that the Federal Society had been showing for twenty years. They no longer cared about your 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 effete legal arguments when it comes <laughs> to the outcomes they want. It's a memo that Diane Feinstein. God rest. I mean, I guess she's still God alive. rest. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I but you know, it's the message she hasn't gotten. Yeah. Right? You know, there, there. Dick Durbin doesn't seem to have gotten the message either, right? Like there are a lot of Democrats and liberals who still think that there is some kind of uh, 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 argumentative space where you can convince a conservative justice based on the law, and right. there that just doesn't exists and it hasn't for 30 years 
And so that leads back to something that, you know, you and I have been talking about and you've been talking about for years, which is not just expanding the court. And I've completely taken your theory and run with it. And I always attribute it to you because I don't like to steal other people's awesome. But, you know, taking the court and not just adding a few more judges, adding 20 more judges, 30 more judges, because the thing that you've always said, and which I absolutely agree with, is that when you have so when you have 15 liberals and 15 conservatives, you're going to get at least five different opinions that come from the liberal side and come from the conservative side, right? It's not going to be, you know, Amy Coney Barrett and all five of her friends all agree on one particular way of thinking. I'm trying to do my best Jesses, Amy Coney Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? They, they all think the same way and there's no diversity of thought even among conservatives, right? Among liberals, there's diversity of thought because you see Elena Kagan siding with conservatives. You see Sotomayor siding. Like they are, they are able to get out of their little box. But conservatives seemingly never are when it comes to the critical rights that people who are listening to this podcast care about. So when when is the Biden administration or Democrats generally, when are they going to wake up and realize that the only way that we can solve democracy is by expanding the court? Because what they're doing, they're not just killing the court. They're killing democracy, and they're also killing the will of people who might want to go to law school in the future and actually help to get us out of this mess. If it seems as if there is no way to get out of this mess, I'm telling prospective law, law school students, go do something else because you will lose your mind otherwise. And that's not particularly helpful if we need more progressive minded people, you know, getting involved in this judicial clusterfuck that you and I are involved in. And you're killing your base, right? It's really hard to get people motivated to come out and vote for me. Well, what have you done? Well, I tried to do all this stuff and the Supreme Court stopped me. Well, okay. Why, why am I going to get out of my car to, to then go help you get elected so you can get smacked by the Supreme Court some more? How, right. how is that a, a good use of my time, right? I, I don't like that argument, but like that is an argument that I have to fight. Like when I go to the barbershop, what I'm fighting against are people who think that there's no point. And I have right. to explain there's absolutely a point. But the point is, eventually, you need to take control of the Supreme Court to make that stop. And I don't have – Democrats don't have my back on this. Mm -hmm. um, when are they going to figure it out? I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I think part of it is a generational thing. Like, they're, like you know, like I, I don't want to be ageist, but I do think that part of it is just older liberals grew up in a time when conservatives were different. Mm -hmm. And they have not, because they're old – have not been able to update their kind of understanding of how the world works, right? Diane it's like Feinstein. trying to get me on TikTok. I see uh -huh. it. I, I see you on TikTok. You have a you have a couple of really good TikToks. So I, I mean, yeah. but it's right, but it's 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 always a grind, right? It's right. not my natural environment. Right. That's liberals when it comes to actually fighting for the Supreme Court in the way that it takes right now. So like part of it I do think is a generational thing. Part of it is that, you know, and we've talked about this before, but like the Federal Society, conservatives, they know exactly what they want when it comes to a judge. They know what they're looking for. They know what kind of person they want. They know what color and mm -hmm. gender and race they are. Um, they know how to build them, right? I mean, take they Amy build Coney them Barrett. from scratch. Amy Barrett basically. was not born. She was made in a lab <laughs> by people right. at Notre Dame who wanted a woman to overturn Roe v. Wade. She was constructed. Mm -hmm. kind of bit by intellectual bit. Liberals have no, no conception of that. You were joking about how the ACS doesn't have as much money as the Federal Society. Absolutely true. But also, if you go to the ACS and you ask them, like, what a liberal judge looks like, what they are, mm -hmm. I mean, you'll get a mushy mouth, well, we just want good judges who will interpret the law faithfully. Like, what the hell is that? Right. right. They, they, they can't tell you what a liberal justice even is anymore right mm -hmm. i can tell you i would i would you know liberal justice you take the 14th amendment is the rule and everything else is suggestions right. and as long as <laughs> right if it fits into the rule that is the 14th amendment that is equal protection for all and substantive due process for everybody then you can have your suggestions but if you don't fit the rule then you get out of my courtroom that's a liberal justice right mm -hmm. but you put it get dick durbin to say that or even understand that i feel at this point right um and so that's really holds back the progressive legal movement that we don't have the bumper sticker you know 
originalism, you know, kind of catchphrases. And we don't have not just the, the will to put more justices on the court, but really the training ground to make new justices. You know, I, 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 the last thing I'll say about this, I've often argued that conservatives understood that they needed more Antonin Scalia's. Mm-hmm. And they went about making them, right? Mm-hmm. Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, they made people like that. Liberals think the next Thurgood Marshall is going to walk into their house. Oh, I happen to be Thurgood Marshall too. Oh, jolly good show. Great, we were looking for one of you. And we have no idea about how to create those kinds of people, how to create liberal justices, how to create true people who will truly uh, uh, take us to the next level in terms of our kinds of arguments. We have no, we have no investment in that. We have no abil- ability to create that. And that is why we are, that's one of the reasons why we are always fighting an asymmetrical war against conservatives. I mean, from my perspective, since we've had Kentaji Brown Jackson on the bench, it seems to me Democrats writ large need to be going in that direction, right? I mean, she's turned out to be more of an originalist than the originalists right? In the arguments that she's made in these cases. So it seems to me, if Democrats are paying attention, they should be looking to her and finding people who think like her. But in my view, I mean, I can imagine what they're doing instead is just looking for another black lady, right? Yep. Like we're going to find J. Michelle Childs, even though they don't have the same judicial philosophies, right? Instead mm-hmm. of trying to find someone who is in that vein, who can c- help her write, help her and Sonia Sotomayor write the dissents that are going to become law in the future, Instead, they're focusing on things that don't matter. On identity politics, right? On and identity it's weird because... politics. And it's like, I think identity politics, all politics in my view are identity politics. But when it comes to like the what Democrats think identity politics is, it's just finding the brown lady, right? It's like when you're casting a show, we got to have a black judge. All the nurses are going to be black. Then all of the main characters are going to be white. It's like they have positions that they put people in and they're unwilling to look beyond that and, and to realize that KBJ is one of the smartest fucking people on the bench right now. I mean, it's one of the things I always said, like, Biden got a freebie when he said that I'm going to appoint the first black woman justice. Of course you were, because KBJ was always the one who should have gotten that job. And quite frankly, she should have been the one Obama nominated instead of Merrick Garland Mm -hmm. in 2016 when Scalia died. And I believe in my heart, can't prove it, believe, have the vibes. (laughs) That's enough. You don't need anything else. The the entire election goes differently. If Hillary Clinton is running with KBJ mm-hmm. instead of ignoring Merrick Garland mm-hmm. during the 2016 election, but anyway. And KBG we know was, how great of a job Merrick Garland is doing right now. I mean, right? KBJ was always a leader in the clubhouse for the next liberal spot on the Supreme Court. And right now, to me, the next leader in the clubhouse should really be Dale Ho. Yes, um, I was just about to say, why haven't they confirmed Dale Ho yet? Right? Like, like that's that's the next guy. And if you want to do identity politics, First Asian American on the Put Supreme Court, blah, blah, blah. Like, there's lots of stuff going for Ho, um, but he's also fierce, and that's the kind of person we need. But again, liberals don't have a have that great understanding of what makes a judge. Monty, can I ask you a question? Because you said something that I don't necessarily agree with, but yeah. but, but it's but this is a I think a if you want to get legal nerdy, a bit of a point of a bit of an interesting point of contention. I completely agree with you that Tanji Brown Jackson has decided you want to do originalism. I will show you some goddamn originalism and just shoves it down their throat. And Mm -hmm. I love her doing it. But my argument is that fundamentally, I'm a Lord of the Rings kind of person, right? The weapon of the enemy cannot be used. It must be destroyed. That originalism by its nature is a wrongheaded, limiting um, judicial philosophy can't ultimately lead to good. Good in the kind of like jousting for the argument, yeah. but ultimately not the philosophy that we should be adopting. But you said maybe we need to find more people like KBJ who are going to make these originalist arguments. So I want you to talk a little bit I about mean, that. I it's, agree it's, with you. I mean, find more people who can poke holes in what conservatives believe originalism to be, right? Conservatives believe that originalism always supports their point. And what KBJ has done very successfully is show that originalism actually doesn't support their point. I don't think she's an originalist, and I don't think we need to get people on the court who are originalists. But I would like to see people who understand originalism so 
so well and who are willing to go and do the work. Like that's what mm. impresses me the most mm. about KBJ is she's willing to go and read congressional hearings from 1860, whatever the fuck, and literally sit down and figure out what they actually thought so that when Clarence Thomas offhandedly writes about what the founders thought, she can go and say, actually, no, that is not what the founders thought. Because I think too frequently we just accept what these yep. conservative judges, particularly the ones who we believe are smarter than the others, right? right. If Brett Kavanaugh came out and said something <laughs> about originalism, we'd be like, eh, fuck you, you're getting it wrong. But if <laughs> Clarence Thomas comes out and says in his very forceful way, this is what originalism is and this is what it does and I'm a black man and I know originalism wouldn't affect me, so trust me when I tell you as a black man that yeah. this is what originalism is, people just buy it. But when KBJ comes in and talks about originalism, she busts through the Supreme Court door, like, oh yeah, this is originalism. She's not really making the case for originalism. She's making the case for you guys are dumbasses yep. because if you were true originalists, you would actually care about what these people thought and not what you think they thought and what you think your constituents, your Fox News teat sucking constituents think that they thought because they're all wrong. So we kind what of a, agree, I think. Yeah, we have reached an accord. That is 100% yes. what she does, and that's why I love her, and she is great at that. Whereas yeah. Neil Gorsuch is out here, like you say, like with, with all the authoritative voice, right. but basically saying, I have looked at the Ouija board <laughs> right? <laughs> and had the seances with the founders. And they said unequivocally that women are not people. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so before I let you go, I do want to give us a chance to just, to just slag off Clarence Thomas a bit, because honestly, I really wanted to spend quite a bit of time slagging him off. And then, you know, Kazmarek and the fifth circuit ended up, you know, messing with my program, but <laughs> I was, I mean, I saw you battling with some of these clowns on Twitter and I was truly astonished. Well, I wasn't astonished. I was amused by the number of white people who stepped forward to say, well, wait a minute. I collect Nazi memorabilia or my grandpappy <laughs> has a, has a KKK hood in his closet. And I don't think that means that he's a Nazi or that he's, he's just, he likes history. It's about collecting and preserving history in my home. What the fuck? I, <laughs> right. What is wrong with these people? It was truly one of those times where I, I just, it was like looking into a white person's problem fractal of <laughs> like every layer it's just the it's just a repeating kind of horrific thing look i know lots of black people i know zero people with nazi memorabilia collections None. zero that is not a problem in the black community even rich black people right byron allen does right. not have right. <laughs> a nazi memorabilia collect oprah does not have a nazi member this is not something that black people do Right. So just like getting into the world where like apparently white people do this and think it's okay was just like, like, you know, all right. But I try to refocus on the, on the, what I thought was the simple proposition that a Supreme Court justice taking gifts and trips and plane rides and resort vacations and yacht trips to Indonesia without disclosing it is a real problem mm -hmm. before we get to the fact that he was taking trips with a Nazi sympathy. Like, before, before we that. get to that, just taking the, the Harlan Crow could have been a very nice not Nazi sympathizer. <laughs> There's no one named Harlan Crow who is not a Nazi sympathizer. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's just, that's just, the he, way he could have been a Charles de Gaulle sympathizer. <laughs> It wouldn't have mattered, right? Like he, right. you're you're taking these gifts, and it's and it's and it's not it's it's unethical. And the idea, and this is a point that I, I've tried to make to people, the idea that Clarence Thomas, who, as we've already discussed, will say with authority, when life begins, what a pregnant person can do with their body, and when that pregnant person can be forced by the state to give birth against their will, mm -hmm. that guy had to phone a friend to figure out, oh my God, should I disclose my like vacations and trips? I don't know. It's a really complicated question. Oh, who can tell? Like, are you kidding me? It's absurd. And like, by the way, because this, this is a launderer podcast, we're among friends. We all know that the friend was Antonin Scalia, right? We all know that the colleague who allegedly told him that he didn't have to disclose these trips was Antonin Scalia, who, wait for it, died at a hunting lodge <laughs> that he was, was went to for, for, with a rich donor. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a fractal of unethical stupidity. And 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 then there's the the corresponding stupidity from Democrats, right? Who when people are clamoring, I mean, people were clamoring for impeachment for Kavanaugh and for impeachment for other people and I always say Let's just, everyone slow your roll. There's going to be no Supreme Court impeachments. Last time they impeached someone was like 1836, some dude named Samuel Clemens, and he got acquitted. Like, it's not something that happens. And also, when it comes to, like, impeaching the first, like, the second black justice, like, that's going to be a little bit dicey. But this is beyond the pale. This isn't just some minor infraction, right? This is millions of dollars in trips this is naked orgies in bohemian grove right like it is absolutely beyond the pale and so when people say hey maybe we should think about just an investigation what do democrats say well the public trust in the supreme court is so undermined that we can't go about impeaching them because it's gonna make it worse what are you talking about what are you literally what are you talking about one of the real kind of insane things about the Democratic Party right now is that they want to maintain the trust in the Supreme Court as an institution. Why? Why exactly? Like, Where? What in the hell is the upside of that? It's, right? Because, it's, it's, and I'll tell you what they'll say, is that, well, because when Trump is elected again, because we're feckless and don't we almost stop him. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Supreme Court tells him not to do Well, then we need people to trust the Supreme Court to, to restrain. And it's like, have you met these people? Like, what are you talking it, about? Ha- like, the <laughs> Trump, what, like, we don't want to be in a world where Trump ignores the Supreme Court order. We already live in that world. We have been the in that decision. world. decision. Yeah. We already live in that world where the Supreme Court ordered Trump to reinstate the DACA program. And he was like, F y'all. And didn't do a damn thing, and nothing happened. So this world that the Democrats think we're living in, where the Supreme Court is going to restrain a, a, a rogue Republican administration from Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis, already doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. The idea that we need public trust in an institution that is floundering, that is failing, that is in desperate need of reform, a reform that can probably only happen once public belief in the institution reaches a nadir. The fact that the Democrats are the ones that are trying to prop it up so they can have their generational Republican control over the Democratic agenda is insane. It is insane. insane. It is insane. So we all... Go ahead. Go ahead. At least I'm a man and nobody can tell me, can take my Viagra away. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm going to overshare with the podcast. I was just told by my doctor yesterday that I am officially menopausal. So my baby maker is closed for business and I am Welcome. officially just fighting for the rights of other people. So hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. But- Get an ice pack. They, I, well, the thing is, is I have a I have a medical condition, a pituitary tumor. So all those symptoms I got when I was in my 30s. So it's oh really God. been quite delightful. <laughs> this whole menopause thing for me, quite frankly. Now, now I'm I'm ready to go see Beyonce in France and just be like, Woo! it's the party. But, you know, I do want to I do. I don't like to leave um, the podcast on a sour note. So. And what menopause what is not have, a sour note. I don't know what you're. Talking. Well, no, beyond, <laughs> menopause and Beyonce are not a sour note, but that doesn't really affect anyone but me, right? Like they can't help me with that. But I do want to talk about what it is you think people can do. You know, if if people's jam is yelling at politicians on Twitter, writing letters, whatever, mutual aid, organizing, what can people do to 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 make something of this moment, right? Because we've got a court that is, we've got federal courts that are going rogue. At the same time, we've got Supreme Court justices revealing their corruption. It seems to me that the time is right for some sort of concerted action. What do you think that concerted action could be? What do you suggest people do? Well, I think people are doing it. People are organizing and they're voting. And what we've seen in state after state and election after election, that forced birth is a losing issue for Republicans, Mm -hmm. right? Like every... The, the, when they do these things, when they succeed in these things, they are sowing the seeds for their own electoral demise. Yeah. I don't mean to sound like Bane from Batman, but like, <laughs> Dre has defeated you. Like, Abortion is, is healthcare, going, Batman. <laughs> that is what's going to defeat the Republicans. They keep winning on the abortion issue, and that makes them keep losing at the polls. And so I think people are, are doing that well and should obviously continue to do that. If I would add something, it would be kind of rolling back to where we kind of started the show, like push back against the terrible media coverage because it's going to be terrible. 
right? And I do think that like liberals a little bit, they get a little bit too kind of like, oh my God, do you see what Fox is doing? Man, Fox does not care. Right. But CNN might. But the Times might. And they're doing the same crap. Right. So CNN and the New York Times and the Washington Post are basically trying to be Fox News and Breitbart light. And if you push back against them, they're the ones who might actually care, listen to you when you take away your subscriptions, when you, uh, when you, if you're going to moan and, 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 and complain about somebody on Twitter, complain to those organizations, complain to those reporters, quite frankly, like all reporters are still, the reason why Twitter still exists is because reporters are still on it. Complaining yeah. to reporters for their terrible takes, you know, when I get blocked by Mag Maggie Haberman, like that's like, cause I'm doing my job, yeah. you know, like the, the, the idea that that the mainstream media is just going to carry the water for these people. Like people need to push back against that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And on that note, we are, I mean, I could sit here and talk to you for hours. <laughs> My producer's like, you guys got to wrap this shit up. So yeah, I was, just, I was the just, chats, just like, dudes, <laughs> stop talking. You lawyers are so verbose. I just want to thank you for jumping in and filling in for Jess. I know she's very jealous. She didn't get to have this conversation with you. Hopefully we can have you back and the, and the three of us can have a chat about all of this nonsense. If you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at angry black lady. If you want to talk to Ellie on Twitter, he's L E N Y C E L I E N Y C. You should get his book. Honestly, reading his book is probably one of the most radical things you could do in terms of rejiggering the way you think about the constitution. I'm, I'm dead ass serious, not just blowing smoke. Um, you should subscribe to rewire news group on Twitter, on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel, because that's when you're going to see notifications that we're doing cool stuff, like talking to Ellie Mistal on the pod. <laughs> Thanks right. so much for having me. Uh, have, let's do it again in, uh, in June when the decisions come out. Oh, for crying out loud. We're going to have to affirmative action you and me on the mic for sure. Right, because that's going away. Because that's going away. <laughs> um, so thank you, listeners and viewers. And what are we going to do, Ellie? See you on the tubes. We're going to see you on the tubes, folks. Mm -hmm.